CYC is a free channel presents the Word of God for everyone. Your support will help us to continue the mission. Visit our website, cycnow.com. Even a dollar will make a difference. What we want to talk about uh, in the next 45 minutes or so, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end, is um, this idea of like the body and the soul, bringing together both the, the physical and the spiritual healing of a person, okay? And in light of the Lent, thought we'd start with this, you know, two months talking to each other. Fasting doesn't mean fast food, okay? We wish it does, but it doesn't. All right, but the reason why I put this up there is because even in our time of Lent right now, we have a certain dietary, let me move this up, we have a certain dietary restriction, but it's not just a dietary restriction. It's a dietary restriction with a purpose, right? So behind the dietary restriction, what are we trying to do? We're trying to use a physical thing to eventually get into our souls, to penetrate our souls, to begin to clear, clean our souls from the different things that have accumulated over time. So there's a physical aspect, but the deeper is a spiritual aspect of what we're trying to do. And if we're not careful, we miss the meaning of it. All right? And even if we look at our church, all right, within our own church, if we look at the sacraments, each sacrament itself has a physical and a spiritual meaning, all right? There's two elements to every sacrament. First one being the physical, and the second one being the spiritual grace, all right? For example, communion. We take bread and we take wine. It's something physical that we see that we're able to take into our bodies, but behind it, and the belief is it that this bread and this wine truly becomes body and blood. There's a physical and a spiritual aspect. Baptism. We fill a you know, big basin with water, we pray and we take a child and we dunk them three times. There's a physical aspect, but the spiritual understanding is, is our cleansing, is our death and our resurrection. My ruin. We take a physical thing such as oil, holy oil, we anoint it on the body, and that's the physical. But underneath, what are we actually doing is we are consecrating the soul, who we are as people who we are as believers in Christ and the mission that we actually have, okay? And so in our sacraments, we see this, all right? But let's look at another example. Let's look at an icon of healing, all right? What are you and I looking at? From a very, like, plain sense, what you and I are looking at are lines, shapes, shades, colors, crafted together in a unique way to portray something more meaningful than just colors, than just shapes. Yes, I see circles. Yes, I see, you know, triangle, a mountain, you know, different things. But when it's crafted together in a unique way, masterfully, what I'm able to do is put together something greater. Okay, I see Christ healing and touching portray something deeper, all right? So in our world, in our, the way we practice, the way we, um, the way we live, like we are both physical and spiritual. We are physical and we are spiritual, all right? So when we look at now our humanity, okay? Humanity is composed of the body and the spirit. You and I, I have a body. But inside my body, my spirit resides. All right? And God was the creator of both. He created and fashioned my body. Not only did he create and fashion my body, but he put it, in it a soul. So he is both the creator of my body and my spirit. And because he is the creator of my body and my spirit, therefore he's the ultimate healer of both my body and my spirit. And who you are as a person is a combination of these two. I can't say, you know, 
Mina, just be body, don't be spirit. It doesn't work. And I can't treat Mina as if he's a spirit because he's a physical body in front of me. So I have to learn and look at him and appreciate his entirety. And, and as healthcare professionals, we need to be able to look at those we, we serve and begin not just to see like body, but we need to be able to see both body and spirit together. And when we appreciate that, that the individual that we see, that we touch, that we talk to, is not just a body, not just somebody who has a physical ailment, but a person who has a physical ailment and attached to that physical ailment is a soul that is experiencing that same ailment. Okay? When you are sick and at home with a fever, you might get depressed. So what do you do? You watch TV. People do different things. But anyway, what are you trying to do? You're trying to make yourself like mentally feel better in spite of the physical problem that you're experiencing. Okay? And, and sometimes because of the way like healthcare you know, progresses and, and makes us, you know, sometimes it wants us to, to act as if we're like we're productions. Like we go and we just see the body. But as, as Christians, we, we need to erase that. We need to erase like what sometimes is pushed on us and we need to look back and say, this individual that I'm looking at, this individual that I'm talking to, is not just pneumonia in front of me, but it's a person who's struggling with the pneumonia. And a person who, sitting in the hospital, trying to fight off this pneumonia, also has a whole life outside, at home, with the different stressors, the different financial stressors, sitting in there in the hospital, in the bed saying, I wonder if my insurance is gonna cover it, you know, what's gonna happen with my work, all these different things. Is that person that we are dealing with just a pneumonia? No, they are a person. And we need to always remind ourselves of this. All right? And so I wanted to take and look at some examples of, of how Christ looked and dealt with us, or how God looked and dealt with us both both as body and flesh, okay? And the first one to look at is, let's look at Adam and Eve. Yes, he was their children, and, and, and they were sitting in, in the Garden of Eden, and they failed, and they ate of the tree, and they were kicked out. But what did Christ do? What did, not Christ do, what did God do to them? He took clothes, and he, and he cared for them. He put clothes on them. He didn't just see them as, as people he was kicking out. He said, yes, they may not be able to live in the garden, but what do they need? They need physical nurturing too. And they don't even know really what that is because they're just beginning to step in this whole new idea of life outside the garden, but he cared. Israelites in, in wandering in the desert for 40 years, he cared about their body. He gave them manna every day. He cared about the body. But not only through the body, but he was starting... And, and always making plans for our soul. And through his different covenants, which he made with Abraham and David and so on, he planned for the salvation of our souls. So not only was he dealing with our physical body, but in his mind and in his actions, he cared tremendously about our soul. And he continued to work on, on both caring for us physically and dealing with us spiritually. He never separated the two. Yes, sometimes he made one harder than the other, all right? But he cared for the two. And, and to him, they were inseparable. And ultimately, through his death and resurrection, not only did he fix the body, but he fixed the soul as well. He combined the body and the soul, and he addressed both of them and became the ultimate healer. He took death, which was the final common pathway of all our bodies, and he conquered it, but at the same time provided an everlasting life for our souls. So as, as Christian healthcare providers, we need to see the same thing. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge to look and say like, if you're a pharmacist, it's a challenge to say, well, this pill bottle is not just a bunch of pills, this is 
something that is going towards somebody and I need to, you know, not just see the name on it and what it is and how many pills and how many refills, but I need to realize like, oh, there's an important medicine. Let me make sure that they know everything about it, that, that I can help them with, okay? And if they're having trouble paying with it, think with them. How do I, how do I help them get around this problem? And the more we push ourselves to look and not just see bodies, but see both the physical and the spiritual, it changes who we are as people. It changes, um, it changes the way we deal with things. All right, I want to take an example. All right, yes, we look at soul and body together, but I want to look at this story. And, and we know this story. It's the lame man who his friends opened up the roof where Jesus was preaching in, and they lowered him in. And, and what did Christ do? What was Christ's first thing that he said? Your sins are forgiven. If you were this man, you wanted to hear, rise up and walk. And let's say, for example, that Jesus never got to the healing. Would this be any less than a miracle than what it was for him to just say, you know, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. If it just stopped there, would it be any less amazing? No, because really, what's more important? Yes, the soul lives eternally, and the body we struggle with for a while, but eventually we'll get a new body. But what Jesus was trying to say is that the soul is eternal, and we need to focus on the soul. And remember that the soul has, you know, will live forever, and it will either go to the eternal life or to Hades. And what he saw was that he wanted this man to enter eternal life. And so he focused on the soul. Yes, the story continued, and yes, he was healed. All right, I'm going to throw another verse up there. All right, Matthew 18, 8, 9. It says, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into eternal life, into life lame or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet and to be cast into everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. All right? So again, the Bible tells us that the soul is extremely important. And in a way, it trumps the body because it's eternal and the body will be replaced. So clearly this leads us to one logical choice. Take your white coat and trash it. Right? That's what I would do. Take your white coat and trash it because the, so the soul matters more. Clearly that's not what I'm here to say. All right? But I wanted to bring out that point because what we want to start to look at is the synergy between the body and the soul. The synergy that can happen when we look at both the physical and the spiritual and begin to weave them together as they are and appreciate the truth that that is, that we can't separate the two, but when we begin to appreciate it and when we begin to address it in its entirety, then the two start to work together. All right? I want to read something that was written. Um, it was written by Father Stanley Harakas, and, and he is an Orthodox um, uh, uh, theologian, and he actually started to write an orthodox perspective, a paper on the orthodox perspective of bioethics. And in bioethics, there's this encyclopedia of bioethics. And the different, you know, um, sects and religious groups and, and so on and so forth submit their, their points of views and their stance on certain issues. And then they're compiled all, and then the code of bioethics is, is, comes out of that. And so, he was the first to begin to write from an orthodox perspective and, and put the orthodox perspective into this encyclopedia of bioethics. All right? And what he said was really nice. He said, medical treatment is also seen as a human cooperation with God's healing purpose and goals. In fact, all of orthodox teaching recognizes a place for human effort striving and cooperating with God's will. 
technically known as synergy. This belief requires the exercise of human talents and abilities for salvation, for spiritual growth, for moral behavior, for achievement of human potential. So in principle, the use of healing, medicines, and even surgical operations have generally been understood throughout history in the church to be appropriate, fitting, and desirable ways of cooperating with God in the healing of human illness. All right? I think this quote is really nice in saying that our God is a God who heals. But He has two ways of doing it. There's a physical way, and He may or may not choose to heal that way, but in cooperation with the physical is the spiritual. And when we really look at these two together, and and we do our part as health care providers to provide that f route of physical healing in a genuine, sincere, and comprehensive way. And I mean comprehensive in, in, in seeing that this person is not just a body in front of me, but, but that this person has a soul and, exp and his soul and his body are linked together. When I appreciate that, then I'm working with God. Okay, and I do not limit myself to saying, oh, this medicine didn't work, I got nothing else to provide. No, you do have other things to provide. You can provide healing in, in so many different ways. But I want to look at this verse, the image and likeness. It comes from Genesis. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And I want to take the image and likeness and I want to break it down and focus on this. When we look at the image, okay, and we say that God made us in our image. Well, God, the image of God, He's an all-being, all-powerful God. His ways are way above our ways. And when He made us in that image, He gave us the ability to think, the ability to apply ourselves, and He even said, you have dominion over the earth. And that way, we are his image. We are the highest you know, functioning species on this earth because we were made in his image, which is completely in line with the practice of medicine. He gave us the ability to understand and study and refine science. That's his image. But when we look at his likeness, okay, our likeness, because us being spirits, during our time on earth, okay, and ultimately into um, eternal, eternal life, like we go through this process of becoming like God, becoming unif unified with Him in His likeness. So we want to become more like God. And because God is infinite in who He is, okay, He surpasses the boundaries of medicine. He surpasses the boundaries of intellect. At a certain point, medicine can only do so much. Okay? But even though medicine may stop and the body may stop, our ability, our soul in its life, eternal journey to be joined with Christ, that never stops. And because that never stops, God has the window for miracles that go beyond what you and I or any healthcare provider can do because we are made in His likeness. And His likeness is well beyond our understanding or our you know, ability within medicine or within you know, any healthcare you know, division you're in or discipline that you're in. God is well beyond that. And when we appreciate that, we begin to bring these two together and we reach our maximal healing potential when we appreciate the two. So I want to talk about a case that I once had, all right? So a seven-year-old African-American, you're not on rounds right now, don't worry, okay? African-American male came in, he had a history 
of CVA is cerebral vascular accident, so that's a stroke. He had a history of heart disease, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and he presented with altered mental status and dysarthria. So he was really slurred in speech and, and really struggling, okay? Brought him in, he had the whole work up, okay, because we thought he had a, a stroke. We got the neurologist on board, the neurologist looked, MRI was clean, and we checked, they checked an EEG, and um, no sign of a seizure focus, CT scan was clear, carotids were clear, everything was clear, they said it's not a stroke, okay? ID was on board, they're like, oh, let's look, make sure there's no infectious etiology, no infectious etiology, the, they did a lumbar puncture and it was clean. Renal was on board because he had some kidney injury in the middle of all this, ended up with azotemia, which is a high BUN level, all right? And when you have a high BUN level, it can permeate the brain and start to cause an altered mentation. All right? But they're saying, no, the kidney is improving. It's coming down. Mental status still not improved. So you get, it's one of these, like, calling all consults, patients. All right? And he just laid there in the bed. And NG tube that goes down to his stomach so it can be fed and, and given medicine. All right? So let's go on. As the patient begins to wake up, the nurse was talking to him, and starts to ask him about his wife. And she noted that once she brought up his wife, he suddenly became angry, dysarthric, and his mental status got depressed. Kind of like reverted back to his presentation. All right? And this is in the, like several days into the hospitalization when every, every other like, discipline is saying, no, it's, it's not from this. On the day of admission, this patient was leaving his wife's funeral. Now, I didn't bring this case to say that all the other disciplines were wrong. No. I'm sure that it you know, probably had, maybe we couldn't pick up a little bit of the stroke on the MRI. Maybe they we're underestimating how much his kidney failure was affecting him. But I'm willing to bet that a factor in this was probably the anguish of his soul. And the body has an amazing ability to shut down due to psychological stresses and present in so many different ways. It's a psychosomatic, psycho being the psyche and somatic being the body, it's a psychosomatic like reflex or so. And so when we begin to appreciate the soul and the body and how they work together and especially if you're in in the mental health like discipline of medicine you appreciate this more than anybody else of how much the mind and the soul can affect the body Saint Maximus the confessor said suffering cleanses the soul infected with the filth of sensual pleasure and detaches it completely from material things by showing it the penalty incurred as a result of affection for them. This is why God in His justice allows the devil to afflict men with torments. Now God, we see it in Job and we see it in everyday life. God can use and chooses to use like physical ailments to do something amazing in the soul. And he may choose not to heal the physical because what he sees is that the benefit from the physical ailment may benefit the soul, and the soul is what lives forever. And so if our Lord chooses to use and appreciate our entirety, then if we are healers and we serve the ultimate healer, then we have to take on the same mindset, same mentality of how we approach who we work with. John 9 is the story of the, the man born blind. Okay? And in the beginning, the, Jesus and his disciples were walking by, and, and, and the disciples said, hey, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus' response completely blew out their understanding of this situation. Okay? Jesus said, neither. This man nor his parents sin, 
but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Okay? God uses physical disability, physical pain, long-term illnesses, different things. Why? Because what he ultimately wants is for his glory to be revealed. But the word that's, that's key, works of God should be. Should be leaves it open. Okay? This man born blind could be the most bitter man ever and refuse to allow Jesus to work with him and to heal him. Should means that it's left up to us how we respond to what's being thrown at us. The different physical diseases, you know, the situations in life, how we respond can play a huge factor in whether we see God's glory revealed in us and whether God's glory would be revealed in the person that you're working with, that you're striving to work towards healing with. Should. And you can play a huge part in getting past the should and saying, let's see what God has revealed. Because you no longer see them and say, well, my definition of success in this person is whether or not they are healed or not. No, my definition of success in this person is, is God's glory revealed in them and in my interaction with them? If that is the ultimate goal, then whether the body is healed or not, it's a bonus if it is. If it's not, it doesn't take away from the glory because God's working for something. And He wants His glory to be revealed in you, in me, and everybody that, that we're able to help. But do you want to take on those eyes? Do you want to begin to change and say, no, I have to look at this person as body and soul and appreciate that they are one and work with them and use all the tools that God has put before us. He uses them and He's the healer. We trust in studies in medicine to guide our decisions. So let's also learn to trust the one who created the body and the soul. And look and see how He used body and soul to heal us. Why? What purpose? His glory in us. Glory be to God forever. Amen.